what what is it used for benjamin trace metal analysis what do we mean by trace metals huh? the word trace mm. a lot or little a little No, no, trace, trace. When I say trace metal analysis, huh? at what at what concentrations are we talking about? AS. What levels are we talking about? Hmm? Level, concentration. When you say trace, and you also now have ultra trace, okay? So at what levels, at what concentrations are we talking about? When we do AAS, what concentration levels can we, um, you know, what, what, what concentrations must our metals in our sample be to use this AAS technique? When you say trace. Remember what I told you? Anybody? PPM or PBB? Parts per million? Parts per billion. Usually, percent. If the sample originally is the level of uh, metal is percentage. Okay. Let's say you have. Oh, in my sample, fifty percent gold. Okay. For whatever reason, you know, the the gold bars that. Do you, do you do you read about? Do you read the papers about Geneva people buying gold bars? No. Hmm. Didn't even look at the star. What what you what papers do you all read? I hope it's just not metro. <laughs> well, if it's fifty percent gold, for example, then if the solution contains fifty percent gold, you cannot go to the AAS instrument and measure your gold directly because the level is too high. Remember absorption, absorption versus concentration is limited. Okay. It cannot be linear. Uh, a, it, it's not proportional to C forever and ever. If the absorbance is too high, it will come a time when it's no longer linear. So then, if you have usually percent, if it's percentage level, you have to dilute. You have to make a dilution so that your sample contains lower levels of the metal. Then only you can bring that sample and do your analysis. Okay. And we already talked about detection limit. Okay, so for, for, for this particular method also, each metal has its own detection limit which is given by the supplier or you, we have discussed how to get it yourself. So because if the level is too low, if uh, the level of metal is too low below the detection limit, also you cannot, you cannot get your answer, like, I suppose, if you do the analysis. Okay? It's too low, below detection limit. You just get rubbish. You, you get numbers, but it's ru just rubbish, okay? So, higher concentrations is limited by at higher concentrations and also below detection limit. Just to get everything in perspective, AAS, what is it used for, okay? Basically, metals, determination of metals. So, we have looked at um, the basic what are the main components? When you talk about AS, you must know this must come to mind. This picture must come to mind. This is the simplest block diagram. You don't even have to draw it particularly. You can just have it as blocks, okay? To show you know what is what are the main components, what are the how is it arranged in the AS instrument. Because you measure absorption, atomic absorption. The species you know we have talked about must ultimately become uh, atoms in a gaseous form and when you measure absorption you must have a source wavelength selector detector signal processor and of course we now come to the part where how do we introduce our sample into the instrument okay and we have said two ways uh, how you um, well introduce your sample plus get the atoms either we have a flame use a flame or we use electrical means to convert your solution ultimately to a gaseous form okay. from solution we say we need to 
we introduce the sample into a nebulizer. Nebulization is the process. Solution becomes aerosol, fine droplets of your sample solution. And then it goes through all these other stories where ultimately you want to have your, you want to have all atoms, you know. But sometimes not 100% of your analyte, the one that you're interested in, become atoms. Maybe it also forms some molecular species or it forms some ions. So in the flame, you have a mixture of all these things. So just to show, uh, you all, we have shown that day um, what the source that we use for AAS, the hollow cathode lamp, okay? Because the, ato the atomic species, the absorption will be a line spectrum. Remember, atoms and molecules, the absorption spectrum will be lines. If you were to imagine the absorption spectrum, it will be, you know, line spectrum which we said has a certain width, the natural width or whatever other factors that increases the line width. Plus the fact once it goes through the monochromator also, the slit, the influence of the slit width will also if, uh, influence the effective bandwidth, okay? But basically you have a line spectrum. The atomic absorption is a line spectrum. So the source used must also be a line source. So these sources, which we will talk about how they work, are uh, <coughs> specific for specific elements. And we have some multi-elements, which we'll again talk about it later on. Okay, so that's the source. Next, we talk about the um, how you want to introduce your sample. Usually, uh, most often, AS, our sample is in solution. So now, how is that solution going to be introduced into the instrument so that it becomes an aerosol? Through a nebulizer. Okay? So I'm afraid I didn't have... If you look at this end, it's, a, it's actually a very fine... Um, stainless steel tubing, some metallic tubing which we then put a plastic, we fit a capillary tube. So that tube will then be dipped into your solution, okay? So we have, so here this end will be uh, dipped into your solution through a capillary tube. And then we have here on the side, because for your flame, you need, for example, the most commonly used flame is air acetylene. Air provides the oxygen, the oxidant. The fuel is acetylene, CuH2, to burn, okay? So, it, so it, the flame forms when C, the acetylene burns with the oxygen. To produce the aerosol, we don't use the fuel, we use air. So air will be through this hole and it'll come out here as we have said uh, in the last, uh, last class, okay? So you have here, in fact, you have the, the central part will be the fine tubing, which will, the sample will go through, and outside it will be where the air goes through, okay? So we said that we, it will form a low pressure region here, so the atmospheric pressure will then press on your, um, solution in your container and will make the solution go up the capillary. As it goes up here, it enters that low pressure region and aerosol will, will be formed. So we will get a fine mist here and uh, the air will be coming at a certain flow rate. Okay, So it will be, if, if we, add, we had such a thing, we had some air on a, from a tank going through this thing, you will get a spray and you get solution and forming a spray. Okay fine spray and we said that this fine spray has a distribution of sizes some big ones some small ones okay so that the, this is the first part this is the nebulizer nebulizer 
converts your solution to an aerosol. Which will then, so we are up to here, okay, the spray. Now the spray has to go into the flame because in the hot flame you will get the uh, dissolvation, volatilization, the molecules changing into an atom, the atom changing to some ions or become excited, all happens in the flame. Yeah, but before, how do, does it enter the flame? Maybe we should show that diagram now, here. Okay, so here is your nebulizer, the one that I, you are going to look. And this is the capillary that I was talking about, the sample capillary which will dip into your solution. So this now fix, this nebulizer is now connected into uh, what is called a spray chamber. From the name, it's some, it's a chamber which, and here's another nebulizer. Go, so the nebulizer here fixes onto a spray chamber. Here is where the gas comes through. The fuel will come through the side of the spray chamber. So in this spray chamber which is hollow, you will get fuel, air, aerosol, all in a mixture. And here is the drain. Like I told you, the aerosol form will be will have a distribution. Big particles, small particles. So of course the big particles when it goes into the spray chamber will hit the wall and eventually go down the drain into your bottle down on the floor. Okay? The drain. The finer droplets will continue up into the burner. This is called burner head. And on top of this burner head, you get your flame burning. Your acetylene and your acetylene oxygen. Acet air. We usually call it, we don't call it oxygen acetylene, you know, because you, you use air. Air acetylene flame will be on top of the burner head. So, all that so what, what, what do we say the temperature of this air settling was? It's in your table, 2000 to 2500, 2100 degrees Celsius. So the flame is a very hot flame. The burner head will also be hot, okay? So that the evaporation, those droplets will undergo dissolvation in the burner head itself because it's so hot. I mean, it's going to be 2000 also, or maybe slightly less, okay? high temperature this thing so the droplets will also begin to the solvent will begin to evaporate and whatnot here even before they enter the actual flame okay um, another thing that we want to say is why must you take the proper precaution when you want to start out and um, ignite the flame uh, you must make sure that you know the air is um, on the fuel you have enough fuel in your tank which has a certain flow rate okay because if you if you if we have said just now in this hollow spray chamber you have a mixture an explosive mixture of air which has oxygen and your acetylene okay that is an explosive mixture if you put uh, if you ignite it in this small chamber, an explosion will occur. Okay. Of course, when it's burning up there, no explosion will occur. Lah. So that's why you must make sure that you have enough acetylene. Because if you don't have enough acetylene, here the flame is burning, the fuel and the oxygen. If it doesn't have enough fuel, let's say you're running the experiment and suddenly you, you didn't notice that the fuel is really low. Okay. So what might happen is, the flame chases after the fuel okay so it will be sucked into this container and that's when you have a what they call what they term as a flashback an explosion in uh, in the spray chamber but of course like I said there are many safety features now for example probably when your uh, acetylene is too low you cannot even light up the flame probably or although this one does not have it the, the spray chamber will have some valves, pop-up valves. So if the pressure becomes too high, those valves will pop out, make a hole, so that the gases can then be released. So no explosion will occur.
Okay, the problem is if you have a an explosive mixture confined in a small space and and a, a fire a flame. So that that causes the explosion. So like I said, I mean nowadays the instruments nowadays are you know uh, foolproof in that sense. So you 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 cannot do the wrong thing. For example, if you if once we pass around this burner head, look at this how narrow, how small this slit is. You know that's where the the fuel, uh, the air, and the settling will go through and form a very uh, quite uh, laminar. What they call a laminar flow. Uh, this is a laminar flow burner head where you have a laminar flow flame compared to a Bunsen burner, which is you know like a candle. It's quite it's quite unstable. So this one will be a more stable flame. If you run an air acetylene flame, you need a, a burner head with a 10 centimeter slit. If you run, if you need a higher temperature flame, an example is we said nitrous oxide acetylene, same fuel acetylene, but in the, the oxidant is now not air, we use nitrous oxide N2O. So for such a flame with a higher temperature, where some metals, for example, strontium is an example which requires the air acetylene flame, a hotter flame will have more energy to atomize the sample plus excite the sample, okay? Because uh, the, the excitation, uh, the formation of the atoms is the energy they get it from the flame. For the nitrous oxide acetylene, you require a 5 centimeter burner head. So even now, it is such that you know there are sensors and whatnot, you put the wrong burner head, you will not be able to light up the flame. Because very dangerous to light up a nitrous oxide flame, a nitrous oxide acetylene with a 10 centimeter slot burner head, which it says also air acetylene. Here it doesn't say, right? Suppose something you ought to know so that's another safety you know a safety feature which we didn't have of course many, many years ago so okay so we from the nebulizer you have your spray chamber but this is a I don't know how many 20 30 years old or maybe 40 years old in the spray chamber although it's not shown there you have also flow spoilers flow spoilers in your in the car ada ke flow spoilers car motor no motor tak ada kot you know just to it doesn't matter lah but this flow spoilers is when the aerosol hits this flow spoilers this is what makes the uh, makes the some of the droplets even smaller or it also prevents the bigger droplets from going up into the flame because the bigger the droplet the more energy it needs to evaporate the solvent etc you know so you don't want the bigger droplets to enter here okay uh, because if uh, you know it might be in the flame uh, and cause some scattering of light and whatnot so you want to get rid of this bigger droplet so one way is by having this flow spoilers where is the drain the drain is here on the bottom of the spray chamber so the bigger droplets hits the walls hits the flow spoilers and will go down the drain to waste so like i said only about 20 percent of the of the sample which is which goes through this capillary eventually goes into the flame actually most of it falls to waste goes to waste another thing that we is not shown that i don't have it to show you is in front of the nebulizer you can have an impactor bead. From the name, it must, the aerosol will impact the bead. So the, when it hits this bead, which is made of you know, quartz or, what, or maybe some um, harder kind of metal or ceramic or whatever, when it hits the bead, the objective is to create uh, finer droplets. So this is another thing that you might have to make the droplets smaller so that more 
will go into the flame. Okay. So the flow spoilers to get rid of the bigger droplets, the impactor bead which is connected to your nebulizer, which um, the purpose is to produce fi uh, finer droplets. This nebulizer also has a that can turn here. This somewhat controls the rate at which the sample will be sucked up or what we call uh, the nebulizer uptake rate or the sample uptake, uptake, you know, they take up the sample. So you can measure, I don't know whether in the 243 we, we ask you to measure the rate at which the sample is sucked up. How can we do that experimentally? Perhaps because uh, why would you want to do it, let's say? You want to optimize. I want to optimize um, what is the best what is the best sample uptake rate so that I get maximum absorbance because what you measure ultimately is absorbance okay but now how does the rate at which the sample is sucked up into the nebulizer influence my absorbance A so how do I measure my sample uptake rate the capillary now maybe you use a 10 milliliter graduating cylinder okay so 10 milliliters, small one. So your capillary now goes into your gradu graduating cylinder. Of course, before you put it in, you have already seen the level, how many mils is in the graduating cylinder. Put the thing in, so it will be sucked up and you measure, let's say, for a minute or for 30 seconds, how many mils is taken up. How many mils of that solution is taken up in such in 30 seconds. So you can measure the mils per minute, the sample uptake rate. And so you can change it accordingly, measure the absorbance, uh, see to see what is the, the best, you know, the optimum sample uptake rate so that you get your maximum absorbance. So that's, an, that's what you have this uh, nebulizer adjusting knob for. And this capillary, if you saw, the, the, the tubing is very fine. So it's a, a tiny tubing. So your sample cannot, you cannot afford to have some big, um, particles because it will definitely clog up clog so C-L-O-G clog up that capillary so sample cannot go through okay so basically the ideal situation is to have a clear solution as your sample uh, what other things okay so this aerosol will then go up here and go into the flame so perhaps when it even goes in the flame, you know, it might be already in a gaseous, gaseous form. Ah, here is the one that I was saying just now, which we don't have in, uh, in this spray chamber. Those pressure relief vents, in case of any, uh, you know, the, the, any kind of explosive, uh, the flame chasing after the, the gases, and you get a build up, a pressure build up here, it will then burst open to release the pressure. So we now, after looking at uh, that part, the, how you introduce a sample the, into the flame, okay? Let's go back and look at, as I've shown this before, the different kinds of flame, and uh, we, we, we talk about this, the air acetylene, most com commonly used, and the nitrous oxide, which is higher in temperature. Uh, you know, use of oxygen is very, you, you have to be more careful if you use oxygen as the oxidant and we can see that you know of course we uh, we obtain higher temperatures if we use oxygen you know but the most conventional ones are these, these two to understand certain steps that you have to do to optimize the instrument setting we have to look at the flame the flame that appears on top of the burner head that you that you see okay so we're looking at the sideways at the flame. So this is the burner head. And this is the flame that's going to be formed. Although I, don't, I didn't bring any brochures. Who has run the AAS experiment? Nobody? Bloom. OK, so you know what the flame looks like, OK? Who has? Only one. AS. So everybody knows the flame. You're not supposed to look at it directly. You're supposed to look at it uh, behind the black shield, OK? Okay, so now we're looking at the cross-section uh, side view of the flame and we find that the flame has several zones, okay? 
the zone that is closest to the burner slot is called the primary combustion zone. This is because this is where the first uh, the mixture begins to burn. Um, the acetylene and the oxygen begins to react here. Okay, primary combustion zone. And then we move up. You have what is called the interzonal region, and the outside this blue external region is called the secondary combustion zone because here uh, it is now in contact with the atmosphere okay so you have these three zones where different things are happening in the different uh, in the different zones okay so where the primary combustion zone you have the most um, um, unstable as, as, as you can think of it that way lah. most energetic reactions are flowing um, here is the thing that I said you must make sure that the flow of fuel and air is sufficient such that the flame burns on top of the burner head and not inside you know because when you ignite the flame essentially you have to nowadays uh, does anybody cook nowadays do you know how to cook? I have to ask the, you know, okay, you know how to cook. You know how to turn on the stove. But the stove is automatic, right? But if it doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't work, then you have to use the lighter. So, when, long time ago, in the 70s, 80s, yes, or even here, we, we didn't have an automatic igniter. Here now, we just press a button, oops, the flame goes on. Last time, we still had to use that thing, okay, the lighter, the gas lighter. So you, you introduce that spark, then only the flame will burn, okay? So we, we must, as I said, ensure that the flow of gases are sufficiently are enough such that the flame is on top. Too low, the flame will eat up into that thing, chase after the fuel, okay? That's what you don't want to happen. So this region is, uh, you know, it's thermodynamic equilibrium is not established and you have all these radicals, etc, etc. When you go higher into the flame, you get the interzonal region and this is the region that will be used for your atomic absorption. Why? We must understand this. If you've run this thing, perhaps, even if you've run this thing, I don't know whether you noticed it anyway, you know, Mr. Mutu turns it on, you just, like a robot, you put in your solution and you take the data. You don't even know what is what. Probably, right? So we should have had the class first. Because you have your source here. Your source will be, if you, if you were to turn on the source and put a piece of paper, the size of the beam will be rather small. Maybe a centimeter in diameter, one centimeter or even less. Okay? Or less. So, this is the source. This will be our burner head. This is the position it's going to be in. Okay, so the source, the light, you want it to go through the atoms. Remember, atomic absorption. We are measuring how much the atoms that are forming the flame will absorb the light coming from the source. So this is, imagine this is like a torchlight burn, shining through the flame. Okay, so, so you don't want this thing to be here. Why? This thing can move. The source cannot move too much. You can optimize, align the lamp, but the alignment is very, the movements are very little. It's, a, it's the burner head that you can move vertically, horizontally, and rotationally. Why? You tell me why now. We want to measure, remember absorption, what it was? Remember, P O P. You tell me what happens. I have the instrument on. I have my flame on with my sample going through, but I have it in such a position that my burner head is too high. It is blocking half the beam. What will my aim, my absorption measurements mean? Will my absorption measurement measure how much at the atoms are absorbing? What happens when it blocks? The burner head blocks the beam. 
Will P be less than PO? Here is PO. PO going through the flame. P going to the detector or the wavelength selector and the detector lah eventually. Okay. But now my, the position of my burner head is too high. I didn't optimize it. You all have to optimize the position of this thing. But I had it too high. I'm blocking part of the beam. If I block part of PO, will P be... What will happen to P? Less. But P is less due to what? To blocking. Not absorption. It should be the atoms form here. The atoms absorb some of PO. So what you are measuring actually, the absorbance as you see, uh, increased absorbance, but not due to your atoms absorbing, which it, which is what you want to measure, but due to your burner head blocking the beam. Okay, so this is must must be optimized, and it doesn't need some sophisticated pressing the the software to optimize it. It's just that you know you can have a, you have the beam on even if, before you have the flame on. You can have a uh, index card, cardboard card. Maybe you all never used index card before, also. Index card where you write your notes nowadays, nobody uses such thing. You know, card with lines, may, maybe. So you put it here, cardboard, okay, with lines. So you put it here, and you can see the beam. You can see the, the image of the beam on the card. So from that, you can see approximately that you want the beam just about, you know, not really centered here, so that the beam is a circle. It's going to be cut into half by the slit. So it's centered and the burner head is not blocking the beam. So you can do that uh, at the beginning. Okay. Okay, the story of the burn that's the story of the burner blocking the the beam. Back to the story of the flame. The primary reaction zone is the one very close to this. Further up you call it the interzonal region. And this is the region which you want to use for atomic absorption. So again, you have your source, you have your burner head with the atom. This is the source of atoms. And here is your monochromator with your slit, tiny slit. So the beam has to be focused onto that slit. So now you have to decide that beam goes through which portion, the primary combustion zone or the interzonal zone so you want the beam to go through that interzonal zone that's the region that that you want to so that you get that's the hottest part of the flame which means that if it's a hottest part of the flame more atoms will be in that re region and so then you measure so that your uh, absorbance that you measure is also maxima maximized okay so not only talking about the, the, the position is important because you don't want to block the beam, also that the beam goes through the interzonal region because from here then it will go into the monochromator. The monochromator is fixed. Okay? This is the one that moves. You won't be able to fix it because that's not the actual one, I think. I don't know whether it's the actual burner head for that particular spray chamber. Okay? Uh, further up, so as the, as the sample is going through here, atoms are being formed. Do not think that the atoms will just stay there, waiting, for the be waiting to absorb the radiation. This is all a dynamic flow of fuel and air, okay? It's always flowing. So the atoms formed here will, will flow with the gases and eventually go to the external part. Okay, it will, it will move up here continuously. So as it goes to the external part of the flame, which is the secondary combustion zone, you are going to get the atoms which are formed will be oxidized by the, uh, with the oxygen in the atmosphere. Because the secondary zone is uh, where the flame is now in contact with your atmosphere. Okay? With regards to the flame, there are two terms that you should know or three rather because remember what the flame is you have your C2H2 your fuel reacting with oxygen to form CO2 and water that's 100% and so if you, if you were to write a reaction for uh, acetylene to 
CO2 and water. The stoichiometric ratio is such that um, you have the ratio of fuel to oxygen um, such that you have 100% combustion. That's called the stoichiometric ratio. But there are cases, there are elements that require a fuel rich. Fuel rich means, still you talk about that ratio, fuel rich means you have more fuel than required. If this is one to one, then the fuel rich means you have more fuel, okay? Then that stoichiometric ratio. And some elements require lean fuel, it's the other way around. So you have less or more oxygen, lah. more oxygen uh, uh, than required to this one-to-one -one ratio. So lean fuel means less fuel than the stoichiometric ratio. Fuel rich means uh, more fuel than the stoichiometric ratio. How do you know you have a fuel rich flame for the air acetylene? Usually the air acetylene, if it's stoichiometric ratio, you have a bluish flame. If you have fuel rich, too much acetylene, it'll be yellow. Yellow and sooty. You know, if you were to put a spatula, it'll become black because you have a lot of it's the the too much fuel, incomplete combustion. Yeah, so that's why you have a lot of these carbon carbon particles. Uh, so yellowish flame. Lean fuel is something that you have to be careful. Remember what I said, we must make sure the fuel and the air is enough. Because you don't want the flame to be chasing into the burner head. So Lean fuel, got to be careful how lean you want to go. Air propane is lower temperature. That means, remember what the flame is for. The flame is to produce those atoms. So for certain elements, the cooler flame, the lower temperature flame is insufficient. You need to go to a higher temperature. So the most commonly used is acetylene, stable, simple to operate, etc, etc. Um, so, fuel rich, you have a lower temperature flame, a flame that is more reducing, which may be useful for elements like molybdenum and aluminium, okay? Uh, fuel rich, because perhaps these elements oxidize more easily. You know, I'm sure you, you will study all this in your inorganic. All these elements, their oxidation or their reducing uh, characteristics are different. Okay? Some are more easily oxidized than others, etc. Et so it'll, all these factors will uh, come into play as to whether you need a fuel rich or lean fuel or whatever. The, more, the hotter flame that is more uh, conventionally, if, if you require a hotter flame, will be the nitrous oxide acetylene. This one has a red interconal region, so it's not going to be just a blue flame that's like a red, they, you call it a red feather, you know, it's in the, in, in, in the middle of the flame, there's a red feather. Higher temperature, uh, so it will um, increase dissociation. So these are some of the elements that you would want, you need nitrous oxide acetylene. Must be operated with care. How do you light up the nitrous oxide acetylene? You know when you one of these elements, you know you need to use nitrous oxide acetylene. But you do not light it up as a nitrous oxide acetylene. You go through the air acetylene first. So you light up air acetylene, and then there'll be a, a, a whatever a thing that you press or whatever that will switch over air to nitrous oxide. So you have all your piping into your instrument but you light up the air acetylene and then when you, you switch over, it will switch from air to nitrous oxide. Then only you have your nitrous oxide acetylene. So you light up through air acetylene. When you want to shut down your nitrous oxide acetylene flame, also through the same way. The nitrous oxide will switch over to air, so you get an air acetylene. Then only from air acetylene, you shut down. You, uh, sh you know, turn, turn off the flame, okay? Always, that's the procedure for nitrous oxide acetylene. Because this flame, if we look at the table that we were giving the, this one, nitrous oxide and air acetylene, uh, acetylene, look at this um, burning velocity. 
burning velocity is the velocity at which that flame eats up you know the fuel and the oxygen so if you compare the air acetylene the the burning velocity is 158 to 266 the nitrous oxide acetylene the burning velocity is a lot faster so that's why I said you have to be careful about the nitrous oxide acetylene you can uh, never run it fuel lean which means not enough fuel not enough fuel the flame is a very fast burning flame it will you know quickly burn into your thing and cause some unnecessary flashback and another thing about the nitrous oxide acetylene it forms uh, a lot of carbon as you're burning the flame you know be, um, it forms carbon deposits so you might have to you know you have only a five centimeter slot so you don't want it to be you know if you are not careful and you don't clean your burner head and this fine slot you don't take a brush to clean it okay no such thing okay uh, the to scrub your pots right okay scrub it make it clean no very fine slit you don't want any jaggedy slits there okay you put it in an ultrasonic uh, sonicator you know ultrasonic uh, uh, a bath to you know finely so that all these things dirt, dirt and whatnot comes out no 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 scrubbing okay so again back to the nitrous oxide settling is five centimeter a lot of carbon deposit so you must clean up during during as you are burning you should clean up if not you know you don't notice it oh you are left with such a small slot okay neither do you want to you know oh use your spatula and cover up you know something to be special care special loving care when you run nitrous oxide acetylene but i'm not trying to scare you because like i said nowadays the instruments are nothing like what i had i was faced with all this safety precaution you know, no problem but you know if you if you act like a clown and just do things all the wrong ways of course you might get into problems um, as I said, it's not a light up with that, make it very ri ri fuel rich and then switch over. Even this, you don't have to do manually. Uh, initially, in the 80s here, we had to switch from air to SN. Now, you don't even have to do that, I think. I mean, it's just a button that you press or something, or you in the software, you know. So, running this, you, will, you shouldn't be feeling... Uh, all your butterflies in your tummy because that's what I had when I had to run this thing because everything was manual you switch manually so you must make sure air acetylene is burning a lot of air and then you switch over and then you do, you do the same thing and then you make sure that you, you do not want to have a flashback with a nitrous oxide acetylene flame now we, we were saying something about just now the different zones now we look at the different zones with respect to temperature okay the last thing that we'll look at i suppose okay so now this is again the burner head this is where the uh, air settling comes up and we look at the the temperature profiles the highest temperature is here so in the interzonal region okay the primary reaction thing is below is lower temperature and the ex the secondary the secondary combustion zone also is lower temperature so here you want to focus your exit slit of your monochromator so that it is somewhere here maybe but this is something that you can optimize so you change your burner head change your position of your burner head zero take the reading change your burner head again put your distilled water zero and then put in your sample measure again so in order to optimize that is how you would optimize your uh, burner head position We are showing here the absorption or absorbance absorbance is a okay the process is absorbance absorption for three different elements and what are we looking at the absorb how the absorbance varies with respect to burner height so what are we doing here when you look at this profile absorbance versus burner height this is fixed this is what you're changing so the the beam is going through different sections of the flame okay or rather 
Yes, because the monochromator, the detector is all fixed. The detector here is fixed. So if you want to see different heights, you must. This is the only thing that you can change. So this is what we find that the profiles are different. For example, for magnesium, this is the lower height means closer to the to the top of the burner head, and you get to a position where the absorbance is maximum. And as you go, as you look at the absorbance further up, it goes down. Unlike silver, it continuously goes up. Chromium is the other way around. And now it's for you to read up why. Why is it so? And for you to tell me the next time. Why for these three elements, they are the absorption profile is different with respect to which part of the flame you're looking at. Remember what is different about the fl flame is temperature, okay? Temp uh, basically temperature and the dynamics of each of the zone. Any questions? Didn't leave much room for you to ask questions. If there's something that you don't understand, you can just... Is it so difficult to raise your hand? I don't understand. I'm going too fast. Not enough time. Not enough time to raise your hand. 